Hello, and welcome to American CME's training course on the Rescue CPR system. I'm David Mills, CPR instructor. Performing high quality CPR is essential if our patients are to have any meaningful chance at surviving cardiac arrest. Thankfully, there are many tools that can help us get it right. We now have a newly approved technology that provides intrathoracic pressure regulation, or IPR therapy, to help make high quality conventional CPR even better. The Rescue CPR system is comprised of the Rescue Pod ITD-16 and the Rescue Pump ACD CPR device. This device combination is the only CPR adjunct with an FDA-approved indication to improve the likelihood of survival in adult patients experiencing non-traumatic cardiac arrest. In fact, a prospective randomized clinical trial demonstrated that performance of rescue CPR resulted in 49% improvement in survival to one year compared to conventional CPR. The goal of this course is to provide you with essential information about the rescue CPR system, but it is intended to accompany a hands-on skill session that will allow you to practice using both devices. This didactic presentation and the hands-on session are both critical components to learning how to perform rescue CPR properly. And while this presentation is consistent with the manufacturer's recommendations, it's important to understand the product's instructions for use, as well as follow your facility's policies and procedures. This rescue CPR system course is specific to the use of the Rescue Pod ITD-16 with the Rescue Pump ACD CPR device. By the end of this course, you will understand the relationship between intrathoracic pressure and blood flow, understand how IPR therapy improves blood flow, understand the physiology of CPR, understand how the rescue CPR system provides IPR therapy during cardiac arrest, and finally, understand how to perform rescue CPR. It's essential to understand the vital interactions between the respiratory and circulatory systems because the body regulates pressures inside the chest in order to influence blood flow and perfusion. As blood travels through the circulatory system, perfusion takes place. Perfusion means that blood is flowing to the tissues to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cells. This circulation also picks up waste products such as lactic acid and carbon dioxide for elimination from the body. All organs of the body need adequate perfusion in order to function properly. The body continually regulates circulation by using positive and negative pressures inside the thoracic cavity. Let's look at how intrathoracic pressure regulation helps to maintain equilibrium. When a healthy person inhales, the diaphragm moves down and the chest wall moves out. This chest expansion creates a vacuum or negative pressure that draws air into the lungs and pulls blood back to the heart. This vacuum also slightly lowers intracranial pressure or ICP. Reducing ICP lowers the resistance to forward blood flow and improves perfusion to the brain. As a person exhales, the diaphragm moves up and the chest wall moves in. This creates a positive pressure that forces air out. However, this positive intrathoracic pressure also inhibits blood flow back to the heart and slightly raises ICP. When we exert ourselves, metabolic needs change and the body regulates intrathoracic pressure to meet these increased demands. To compensate, we breathe harder, faster, and deeper, enhancing the vacuum in the chest. This pulls more air into the lungs, more blood back to the heart, and lowers ICP. The net result is improved vital organ blood flow. This compensation also occurs during shock. As tissue perfusion drops, the body attempts to maintain blood flow by increasing the respiratory and heart rates and by constricting peripheral blood vessels. But if the cause of the shock is not reversed, the body eventually loses its ability to compensate and the blood pressure falls and perfusion is compromised. Intrathoracic pressure regulation, or IPR therapy, is used to enhance negative intrathoracic pressure to help the body help itself, 
during states of shock and cardiac arrest. Studies show that IPR therapy does this by providing a slight amount of therapeutic resistance to the influx of air. This enhanced vacuum pulls more blood back to the chest and heart, increasing preload in cardiac output. It also lowers ICP, making it easier to circulate blood to the brain. Think of IPR therapy as the opposite of CPAP, which delivers positive pressure to patients with congestive heart failure in order to drive fluid out of the lungs and lower blood pressure. In summary, IPR therapy provides an innovative way for the body to leverage its own natural physiology in order to provide perfusion on demand in states of shock and cardiac arrest. Did you know that no matter how good you are at CPR, you can only generate about 25 to 40 percent of normal blood flow to vital organs? Think about that for a second. No matter how well you perform CPR, you're only about a third as efficient as a normal beating heart. Limited blood flow during CPR occurs for two primary reasons. First, as the chest wall recoils, air is drawn in through an open airway. This diminishes the vacuum, or negative pressure, that helps return blood to the heart. Second, many healthcare providers do not perform high-quality CPR, and these errors compromise blood flow. Let's begin by talking about the first reason. During CPR, blood is circulated forward by two mechanisms. With the cardiac pump mechanism, the heart is compressed between the sternum and the spine, and this helps force blood out. More importantly, the chest also becomes a thoracic pump. Chest compression creates positive pressure that forces blood out of the heart and air out of the lungs. Compression also causes a slight increase in ICP, which reduces cerebral perfusion. Then, during the decompression phase, the chest wall passively recoils, creating a slight negative intrathoracic pressure. This vacuum draws sun blood back into the heart, pulls some air into the lungs, and fills the coronary arteries. ICP is also slightly lowered during decompression, which helps with cerebral perfusion. Chest compressions and decompressions create a sequence of alternating positive and negative intrathoracic pressures that help to circulate blood. The more blood that can be returned to the heart, called preload, the more blood that can be circulated forward on the next compression. Optimizing preload is critical for maximizing the effectiveness of CPR. Blood flow during CPR can be limited because just as the chest wall begins to recoil, air rushes in through the open airway and diminishes the vacuum that is needed to fill the heart. Once the negative pressure is gone, the heart stops filling. This diminished preload results in decreased cardiac output on the next compression. Let's talk about the second issue, CPR quality. Studies show that caregivers often make errors during the performance of CPR that further compromise its effectiveness. For example, ventilating too often or with too much tidal volume causes excessive positive intrathoracic pressure that limits blood flow back to the heart and increases ICP. Compressing too slowly fails to generate enough pressure within the circulatory system. Compressing too fast limits preload because the heart does not have enough time to fill with blood. Finally, if the chest wall does not recoil completely, it results in decreased blood flow back to the heart. All of these factors can compromise cardiac output, and remember, less cardiac output means less perfusion. Given that we only get about a third of normal blood flow with the best manual CPR, it's important to get it right. Begin compressions as soon as possible. Minimize interruptions and try to achieve a compression fraction of greater than 80%. Provide proper chest compressions at a rate of 100 to 120 per minute a depth of 2 to 2.4 inches for adult patients, and allow complete chest wall recoil. Provide proper ventilations. For intubated patients, deliver one breath every six seconds, delivering each breath over a duration of one second and with only enough tidal volume to produce visible chest rise. 
The Rescue CPR system is a device combination that provides IPR therapy during cardiac arrest. The two components of the Rescue CPR system are the Rescue Pod ITD-16 and the Rescue Pump ACD CPR device. We'll review what each device does individually, and then we'll talk about how the synergy of using them together produces better hemodynamics and increases the likelihood of survival. Let's begin by talking about how the Rescue Pod ITD-16 works and how to use it on a face mask or advanced airway. Recall that during CPR, positive pressure helps to circulate blood forward, while negative pressure, or a vacuum, helps to refill the heart. An impedance threshold device, or ITD, fits into the airway circuit on a face mask or advanced airway. During chest compression, the ITD's valve opens and air is forced out of the lungs and through the ITD without resistance. But as the chest wall recoils, the ITD's valve closes and prevents air from being drawn back in, preventing the influx of air back into the lungs enhances the negative pressure, which pulls more blood back to the chest and heart. The increased preload results in increased cardiac output on the next compression. This enhanced vacuum also lowers ICP, which increases blood flow to the brain. It's important to note the ITD does not restrict the rescuer's ability to ventilate. Applying a rescue pod as soon as possible after chest compressions have begun helps to optimize blood flow during the early and most critical phases of CPR. Let's take a look at how to do that. First, let's discuss how to use the Rescue Pod ITD on a face mask. Begin by attaching the Rescue Pod to the face mask. Next, apply an end tidal CO2 sensor if available. Then, attach the ventilation source, such as a resuscitation bag, to the top of the circuit. Once the circuit is prepared, spread the cushion and position the mask over the patient's nose and mouth. Use a two-handed technique to ensure a good seal against the patient's face. A good face mask seal is critical for providing IPR therapy during BLS airway management. Using a head strap may help to maintain an airtight seal. Next, open the patient's airway, being careful to lift the jaw to the face mask. Then, begin providing ventilations at the recommended compression to ventilation ratio. Ideally, the person at the airway maintains the face mask seal using two hands, while another provider ventilates. Ventilate over one second and with only enough tidal volume to achieve chest rise. Excessive ventilation has been shown to decrease the ITD's ability to enhance negative pressure and blood flow. Now let's discuss how to use the Rescue Pod ITD-16 on an advanced airway, such as an ET tube or supraglottic airway device. Once an advanced airway has been placed, secure it using a commercial tube restraint. Then, attach the Rescue Pod to the airway device. Next, apply an end tidal CO2 sensor, if available. After that, attach the resuscitation bag. Now, Turn on the timing assist lights, which flash 10 times per minute. Each time the lights flash, provide one ventilation. Remember, ventilate over one second and with only enough tidal volume to achieve chest rise. If the rescue pod fills with secretions, remove it from the circuit and use the ventilation source to clear it. The Rescue Pod ITD is for single patient use only and should be disposed of properly after it has been used. In summary, the Rescue Pod provides IPR therapy by preventing the influx of air back into the lungs on chest wall recoil, which enhances the negative pressure in the chest during CPR. This vacuum pulls more blood back to the chest and heart resulting in increased preload in cardiac output on the next compression. This enhanced vacuum also lowers ICP, making it easier to get blood to flow to the brain. As we mentioned, the Rescue CPR system is a device combination that provides IPR therapy during cardiac arrest. 
You've just learned about the RescuePod ITD-16. Now let's cover how the rescue pump works and how to use it to perform active compression, decompression, or ACD CPR. Compressions and decompressions are both critical phases for optimizing blood flow during CPR. The rescue pump allows providers to actively compress and then actively decompress or lift the chest during CPR. When used with the rescue pod, the rescue pump further enhances the vacuum in the chest. Sometimes the chest wall doesn't always recoil well. This may be due to a stiff or non-compliant chest, broken ribs, compressions that are too fast, or providers who fatigue and begin leaning on the chest. If the chest wall does not recoil completely, it results in decreased blood flow back to the heart. The rescue pump is intended to address this problem by promoting complete and active recoil of the chest, and it is the only FDA-approved device that allows providers to perform ACD CPR with a lifting force of 10 kilograms. The rescue pump is a handheld suction cup. A force gauge guides compression and lifting forces. The green area indicates compression forces, and the purple area indicates lifting forces. The bottom of the red arrow indicates the amount of force being applied. Here we see the red arrow at zero, indicating that no compression or lifting force is being applied. An audible two-tone metronome is available to help guide compression rate. Push the button once to turn it on, and once more to turn it off. The compression rate for rescue CPR is 80 compressions per minute. This rate is a little slower than what is recommended for manual CPR in order to allow more ventricular filling time for the enhanced preload. Because 80 compressions per minute is slower than what you're used to, it's important to use the metronome to help achieve the proper rate. To perform ACD CPR, remove clothing from the patient's chest. Next, place the suction cup in the middle of the chest, making sure that the lip of the suction cup is above the xiphoid process. Make sure the defibrillation pads do not interfere with the suction cup. Then, get into position. The correct body position for ACD CPR is the same as for manual CPR, making sure to position yourself higher than the patient. Quickly adjust the height of the bed to ensure the compressor is properly above the patient positioned with their shoulders directly above the patient's sternum. Providers may benefit from utilizing a stool to achieve the correct position. Your arms should be straight, just as they are for manual CPR. Ensure the patient is on a firm surface, such as a backboard, or use the CPR mode that is available with some mattresses. If it is safe to do so, position the patient closer to the side of the bed where compressions will be delivered. Bend at your waist and use your entire upper body to compress. Use enough force to achieve proper depth and then note how much force is required to achieve this depth. Just as with manual CPR, the amount of force will vary for each patient depending on how compliant their chest is. For reference, the amount of force needed to compress an adult's chest 2 inches is approximately 30 kilograms for a soft or supple chest, 30 to 40 kilograms for a chest of average compliance, and 40 to 50 kilograms for a stiff chest. For this patient, 40 kilograms is being applied to achieve a 2-inch compression depth. For most patients, 40 kilograms will be sufficient to achieve a 2-inch compression depth. To decompress, once again, use your entire upper body and attempt to lift up with enough force to actively re-expand the chest to 10 kilograms on the force gauge. It is not necessary to lift more than that. This is what the force gauge looks like with 10 kilograms of lift being applied. While you are learning ACD CPR, begin by compressing and lifting slowly to make sure your body position is correct and to get a feel for the proper compression and lifting forces. Once you feel comfortable with that, then you can begin to increase your speed. Ultimately, the goal is to compress and lift 80 times per minute. Once you have your technique down, turn on the metronome, compress on one tone, and lift on the next. An easy way to get coordinated with the tones is to think push-lift, push-lift with each alternating tone. 
Here's what proper ACD CPR should look like. Now here are a few tips to keep in mind as you learn ACD CPR. First, don't grip the handle harder than necessary. Hold the rescue pump firm enough to control it, but don't overstrain your grip or forearms. Second, once you know how much force is required to compress to the proper depth, use that amount of force as a guide for continued compressions. Third, the tendency is to compress faster than you have to. Use the metronome to make sure you achieve the proper cadence. Fourth, remember to actively lift after each compression. This is not something you're used to doing, so make sure you actively decompress enough to see the force gauge move beyond zero to 10 kilograms. Remember though, it's not necessary to lift more than that. Fifth, rotate duties at least every two minutes to minimize fatigue. Sixth, provider body position is important. Put the bed at the proper height, lowering it as necessary to make sure the compressor's shoulders are directly over the patient's sternum. Providers may benefit from a stool to achieve correct positioning above the patient. And finally, always make sure the patient is on a hard surface anytime you're providing CPR. After each use, the suction cup may be replaced with a new one. The handle can be wiped clean but should never be submersed in water. See the instructions for use for directions on how to properly clean following each use. Studies have shown that we can achieve good suction on most patients. Because of this, you may notice some reddening or bruising on the patient's skin under the suction cup. This is common. It should not be of concern during CPR. Even when performed correctly, there is always the potential to break ribs, no matter what type of CPR you're performing. If you suspect rib fractures, check to make sure you're compressing in the proper position and then continue. The suction cup may actually help with chest wall recoil in the event that rib fractures occur. If the chest is excessively hairy, it may be necessary to shave it quickly to remove some of the hair, but an average amount of chest hair is usually not a problem. If the chest is excessively wet or diaphoretic, you can wipe it quickly with the patient's clothing or a towel. Occasionally, it may be difficult to achieve good suction, but this has been shown to occur less than 10% of the time. If you lose suction, check to make sure the lip of the cup is not too low on the chest. Remember, it must be above the xiphoid process. Also, check your body position to make sure your shoulders are directly above the device. Lifting up at an angle can cause the suction cup to dislodge. Finally, don't lift with too much force. If the cup dislodges, simply reposition it and then pull up with less force on the next compression. Even if you're not able to pull up with 10 kilograms of lift, simply coming back to neutral will help the patient. If suction difficulties are distracting you from performing good CPR, then discontinue use of the device and revert back to high-quality manual or automated CPR. Okay, let's quickly summarize the key elements of performing ACD CPR in adults. Make sure you are properly positioned above the patient. In most cases, you will need to lower the bed or use a stool to help achieve the proper position. Use the metronome to guide compressions at a rate of 80 per minute. Compress to a depth of 2 inches and note the amount of force required to achieve that depth. Attempt to actively lift to 10 kilograms on the force gauge. And finally, bend at the waist. Keep your arms straight and use your entire upper body to both compress and lift. Now that you understand how the rescue pod and rescue pump each work, let's talk about the benefits of using them together to perform rescue CPR, which is the performance of ACD CPR in conjunction with an ITD. This device combination provides IPR therapy to maximize vital organ blood flow and provide perfusion on demand during cardiac arrest. In the United States, the Rescue CPR system is the only CPR device combination that has an FDA-approved indication for improving the likelihood of survival in adult patients in non-traumatic cardiac arrest. And the Rescue Pump is the only FDA-approved device that allows the performance of ACD CPR with up to 10 kilograms of active decompression. 
There are no contraindications to its use, but please refer to the product instructions for use for a complete listing of all warnings and precautions. Here's how rescue CPR works. Recall that during conventional CPR, positive pressure generated during compression circulates blood forward, while the negative pressure or vacuum created during decompression refills the heart. Optimizing preload is critical for maximizing the effectiveness of CPR. ACD CPR is performed using the rescue pump, which adheres to the chest and is compressed to the same depth as in manual CPR. Each active compression circulates blood forward, forces air out, and slightly increases ICP. During decompression, instead of relying on the chest to passively recoil, the rescuer uses the rescue pump to actively lift the chest wall with up to 10 kilograms of force. This optimizes chest wall re-expansion, creating the critical vacuum that refills the heart with blood, draws air in, and slightly lowers ICP. ACD CPR does a good job of actively compressing and re-expanding the chest, but an open airway limits the vacuum that can form. The result is that negative intrathoracic pressure with ACD CPR alone may be similar to what occurs with conventional CPR. Adding an ITD to ACD CPR prevents the influx of air during the active decompression phase. This significantly enhances the vacuum, resulting in both improved blood flow back to the heart and lowers ICP, which again enhances blood flow to the brain. These devices work together synergistically to create better blood flow than either device used alone. The rescue pod regulates air movement to enhance the negative pressure, while the rescue pump actively expands the chest and further optimizes the hemodynamic effects. Preclinical studies have shown that compared to conventional CPR, rescue CPR doubled blood flow to the heart and produced near normal cerebral blood flow. A clinical trial found that rescue CPR produced near normal blood pressure and another large randomized clinical trial found that rescue CPR increased survival at one year by 49% compared to conventional CPR. Now that you understand each of the rescue CPR system components and why they're more effective together, let's learn how to use them to perform high quality rescue CPR. We'll begin with performing rescue CPR during basic airway management and then move on to performing it during advanced airway management. Begin by ensuring that the patient is pulseless and that CPR is indicated. Remove the patient's clothing and place the rescue pump in the middle of the chest. Get into proper position. Remember to lower the bed and use a stool if necessary. Turn on the metronome and start compressions at 80 compressions per minute. Each compression should be approximately two inches in depth. Note how much force is required to achieve this depth. During decompression, attempt to actively lift the chest with 10 kilograms of force. If a 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio is being used, the compressor should count out loud to 30. Another provider should assemble the face mask, rescue pod, end tidal CO2 sensor, and resuscitation bag. When ready, position it on the patient and use a two-handed technique to open the airway and maintain an airtight seal at all times. A head strap may be helpful for this. After 30 compressions, pause for the two ventilations. It's best if a third provider or the person performing compressions provides the ventilations. This allows the provider at the head to focus on maintaining the face mask seal, which is necessary to produce the enhanced vacuum. When available, place the electrodes and prepare the defibrillator. Continue using a 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio until a pulse returns or as dictated by your facility's policies and procedures. Once an advanced airway has been placed, secure it using a commercial tube restraint. Move the rescue pod ITD to the airway and turn on the timing assist lights. Now begin providing continuous chest compressions at 80 compressions per minute. Ventilate each time the rescue pod's lights flash, ideally during the active decompression phase. There is one more important thing to know about rescue CPR. 
because this device combination has been shown in a preclinical study to provide near normal blood flow to the brain and in a clinical study to provide near normal blood pressure, there's a chance that while providing rescue CPR, your patient may show signs of improved levels of consciousness despite not having a pulse. If you see signs such as gasping, gagging, breathing, eye opening, or limb movement, stop and quickly check for a pulse. If there is none, resume rescue CPR and manage the patient as needed, which may include gently restraining them. If a pulse is present, remove both devices and continue care per your facility's policies and procedures. Now let's watch what the first 30 seconds of high quality rescue CPR with a face mask and then the first 30 seconds of high quality rescue CPR with an advanced airway should look like. Sir, sir, are you okay? No pulse, starting CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, 30. Remember to keep these important points in mind when performing high quality rescue CPR. Ensure proper positioning over the patient. Lower the bed or use a stool if necessary. Compress to approximately 2 inches and note the force required to achieve this depth. Actively decompress, lifting to 10 kilograms. Use the metronome to guide compressions at a rate of 80 compressions per minute. Apply the rescue pod early to deliver the hemodynamic benefits of IPR therapy as soon as possible. Ventilate over one second and with only enough tidal volume to achieve chest rise. During basic airway management, maintain an airtight face mask seal throughout compressions and ventilations. Rotate duties at least every two minutes to minimize fatigue. When a pulse returns, remove both devices immediately. And finally, if the patient re-arrests, replace both devices. Okay. You now have all the information you need to begin practicing rescue CPR, which is use of an ITD in combination with ACD CPR. Because the psychomotor skills are a little different from manual CPR, it's important to practice frequently. Make sure you train with these devices regularly so that you're ready to be effective when it counts. Finally, there are two more essential activities that should be a part of your efforts to improve survival from cardiac arrest. The first includes debriefing after every cardiac arrest call to review what went right and identify what could be improved upon. Second, collect data. It's pretty hard to get better if you don't know where you're starting from. Zoll Medical is focused on advancing resuscitation today by providing IPR therapy and advanced technologies to improve outcomes from sudden cardiac arrest. For more information on any component you've seen in this program, please visit zoll.com. Thanks for watching and have a great day.